Well, good evening, everyone. Excited to get started in the Bible class tonight. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 20. Um, so if you want to go ahead and get settled in, get your favorite beverage, get your pillow adjusted and your seat in the upright position, and <laughs> let's get our Bibles going. Yeah, can you tell I've been drinking coffee today? <laughs> you know, I talk like I'm always drinking a ton of coffee, but I started really looking at it, and it's like, not really, but... I talk a good game like I do all the, like I won't even finish this one, but we do have the social media, the chat up so I can read it and see it. It's like really in my face now. And so hopefully I'll be able to respond a little more timely and not be caught back on, you know, whenever it comes up and sometimes I just keep going and then I look down and see it. I'm like, oh, okay, somebody made a comment or something. So please, I really encourage you, if you're watching this on live stream, please uh, let us know you're out there. It's encouraging. And, um, and, and ask questions, stop me, and we'll, I'll do my best. I'll tell you right now, I'm not a Bible scholar. Um, I don't know all the stuff, but I think we can come up with a good, good reasoning. And uh, I hope that someday, if you're able to and you live here close, that you'll come down and encourage us and be physically present with us. And there's, you know, it's, it's not like the old days. It was just amazing. In the old days, we didn't have all this technology, and we, we didn't have the same reach. So there's like a two-edged sword. I understand. You know, this is great because, you know, these classes are recorded, and they're going to be there, and, and they're reaching a lot of people that aren't in the city. They're also reaching people who are not going to be able to be here with us. That's beautiful. But I just wonder about you, who may have a car, who have no excuse, except you're sitting at your house. Uh, that kind of bugs me, because we make the effort to come down and be here, and it's so encouraging to look at somebody besides empty buildings. So if you could be here, we would just love to have you here and be able to engage with you. And that's really what it's about, is us being together. But now I'm not trying to guilt you. If you know who you are, then let it guilt you. But if not, well, okay. I'm not trying to go either way, but I want to encourage you. Hello, Aline and Terrell. Good to have you with us this evening. And I'm not picking on you guys either. Like I said, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad who can't legitimately be here, that it's not safe for you to be here. But there are some that, you know, might have a car, have the, the, the opportunity, and not, no health, no threats or anything, you, you come be with us, <laughs> encourage us so that we can grow together. That's a part of our mission as Christians is to encourage one another. I believe audio is good, video is good. I've been really testing it all day long. So let's get started. So we're, we're kind of at the back end of this rebellion that was a big monster one that exploded out because of Absalom. And the previous chapter, we looked at Absalom's demise and the failure of that coup. The ramifications of that coup continue to, like a, like a rock being thrown in a pond, it's going to have ripple effect. We saw that immediately after uh, Absalom was killed, he kind of went into a mourning status, you know, mourning and weeping, and Joab came in and kind of snapped at him and said, hey, pull it together, um, and he did. He, got, he went out there, he got, went in front of the people, made himself known, and then the next phase was really, we started to see last week, where he's trying to reconcile, trying to bring them back together. And this is the brilliance. This is the spiritual side of David that's just amazing, the wisdom he has. He showed us this when he was, when he first came in and ruled Judah after King Saul died, was killed, and he was anointed by the tribe of Judah. Well, he still had the other 11 tribes who weren't standing up with him. So we had civil war for seven and a half years. And he did not just go up there and invade them and conquer and kill people and dominate and make himself king over all of them. He used a very spiritual methodology to unite them. That Joab is going to come up tonight very significantly. And he was a problem the first time when he was trying to reunite the tribes. You remember Abner? He had come down. He was the commanding general of Isposheth, King Saul's son who was ruling as a king for the ten northern tribes. Abner comes down. He's going to reconcile. Joab won't have anything to do with it. All he can see is the fact that Abner killed his brother, remember, at the pool of Gibeon. 
And his brother wouldn't give up. If you'll recall that encounter, his brother, you know, just kept pursuing Abner. And Abner turned around and looked at him and said, look, you keep coming at me. I, I'm going to kill you. And he would not relent. He got killed. Abner killed him. Joab lost his mind. So from that point on, he was going to kill Abner. That's the type of man that he is. So whenever this reconciliation is going to occur, Abner comes down. David says, hey, that's great. We're going to reconcile. He murders Abner. He's not going to stop there. We saw that it happened with uh, Absalom as well, right? David very clearly gave the order, do not harm the boy. Do not harm the boy. And what did he do? He harmed the boy. He murdered the boy. He didn't just, you know, kill him. He murdered him, honestly. It was, it was straight up a murder because he knew he was vulnerable. He had him captive, and he still thrust the spears into him. He was even told by somebody that was standing there, the king told you and the other commanders, don't harm the boy. So that's some of the drama that came about. Now, Absalom got what he deserved. I mean, there's a lot of problems with that, but still there's this relationship between David and Joab that we're going to see develop tonight. But this repercussions of that rebellion is still going to continue on. So after he then has... The threat removed, he is still outside of Jerusalem. He's not in the city. He has this issue of reconciliation again because all the tribes had anointed his son. And now they have to come back and realize, oh, the guy that we anointed is dead. So what are we going to do? And the sad part was all the tribes and the elders of the other 10 northern tribes came to him and said, hey, we're with you, David. We're with you. And Judah drugged their feet. David had to send the high priest down to Judah and talk to them. And his message, again, was one of reconciliation. Um, and, and it worked. Well, Judah's so excited, they come up and they beat everyone to the River Jordan to help him cross. This is key. Because all the other tribes show up, Judah's there, and a fight breaks out. This is what we need to look at here in chapter 19. When we see that they start fighting among themselves because of this. And so in verse 41, um, then all the men of Israel came to the king and they said to the king, Why are our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household over the Jordan and all David's men with him? And all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel because he is uh, the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense, or has he given us any gift? Then the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, We have ten shares in the king, and David also, we have more than you, Judah. There's more of us in equal parts, then that means we have an invested interest in him as our king. So he said, Why then do you despise us? They're they're calling Judah out. We were not the first to speak of bringing him back, question mark. Weren't we the ones who actually stood up first and you were the last? Kind of a thump in the chest. We look at this last part of that verse. But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. I looked at the video last week and Becky, you had brought up the idea and I didn't answer it and say it out loud what was going on. But Becky had brought up the idea at the end of the class last week, well, what what was that mean, fierce there? Um, And I think that it was that they were more, they prevailed, they were much more uh, angry, and they came back and attacked them, the other tribe elders. And so this sets the stage. So even though we have a chapter break that was broke by men, not God, or not the writer of 2 Samuel, we see then what fires off next. And so this is when we get into chapter 20. We're going to start there and look at the rebellion of of Sheba. And I I just love the very first description. So let's go ahead and read verses 1 and 2, what it describes him. Now, there happened to be a worthless man whose name was Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and he said, We have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba, son of Bichri. But the men of Judah stayed by their king 
all the way from the Jordan to Jerusalem. So this occurs right at the river, the Jordan. And that's a part of this fight. And that's why this is one of those chapter breaks that just kind of can separate the importance of where did this rebellion come from. Again, it's kind of ironic that it was the ten northern tribes that right after Absalom's death, that they were the first that wanted to reconcile and accepted David as king. Judah was the last. Judah finally accepts. They show up at the river first. They bring the king over. Ten other tribes show up, and they're upset because you're showing favoritism or they're jealous, and they have this fight. So that's why it's interesting how that all of a sudden this one worthless man. What is a worthless man? Rebel. Yeah, that's what the... He just he, he does. He reminds me of reminds me of I forgot his, who Ziba who was throwing stones when David was leaving Jerusalem, and then they, all of a sudden he's on the wrong side, and David forgave him. Um, and you know it. And really, I I do like the King James. Uh, the ESV is the one that says a worthless man, a rebel. That's why sometimes the translations, even though the Greek word, it, it does reflect both a worthless man and it can be also used as a rebel. So don't think there's a contradiction or there's an error, but it depends on the context. So yeah, he is pretty worthless, but I think rebel may have been a kind of a better way of explaining it to him, somebody. So whoa, he's, he's capitalizing on this rebellion, isn't he? On this, this dissent between the tribes. Now, what is interesting, and, and as we go through this, we're going to see um, what his outcome is. But this man stirs all this up, and really nobody really follows him. He, he just, and that's what you see a lot of times in groups of Christians, is one person that has a rebellious heart will find people who are discontent and work with them, and stir them up. And I'll bet you that's exactly what Sheba did, was he listened, he heard those with the loudest complaints and yelling back. All of us. Yeah, like I said, it's like he says we. So he's like us, we're buddies, you know, we're in this together. And that's the way that they wedge themselves in. But I bet you for sure he's working with the ones who are still discontent and upset and still got a lot of fever about this engagement, what Judah is saying to them. So there's three things that he kind of says in this. We have no portion in David. Now, wait a minute. The elders endorsed him. They anointed him again as king. So what authority do you have? But you see, that's the problem is when you're angry and you're passionate you don't listen to the reason. So these angry men allowed him to drive a wedge even further because they should have looked at him and said, who are you? Are you an elder? Are you a, what, what tribe are you an elder of? Because you have no right really to say, we have no portion. Because that's what they're saying. Remember portion? When they, when they told Judah, you know what? We have 10 portions in the king. Now, and all the elders accepted him as king, and what's their option? What, what option is he giving them? He really doesn't. He doesn't provide them a solution. All he's giving them is chaos. He doesn't say, I would be a better king. He doesn't say, let's get Methbosheth. He doesn't say, let's pick another one of his sons. He'd be a better king. He just stirs it up to see what's going to happen and cause this dissent among them. So he says, we don't anoint him. They did. The elders did. Then they said, but now understand, we know that all of Israel deserts him. Now, when it says all of Israel, we're talking about all the ten tribes in the north. They, 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 they buy into this. We have no inheritance of the son of Jesse. And really now you're going to his heritage, aren't you? Because who is Jesse? He's nothing special. You know, I mean, they're... It's kind of, it's, it's more, when you looked at this and I looked at that idea, big deal. It's like, why do you bring my dad into this? Why, why would you bring someone's dad into it? Unless it's like lineage. Quality of your lineage. <laughs> your father was a sheep herder. 
He wasn't rich. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't uh, nothing significant. So that's the second thing. And then he says, every man to his tents. He tells everybody to divide, to leave. Again, the, he is not an elder. The men who are listening to him, I, I want to ask if they were still around, I'd say, where are your elders? Why did the elders not step up? Why are the elders allowing this rebel? You think this is the first time they figured out this guy was worthless? Usually not. Usually people that are rebellious, they're rebellious beyond that absolute moment. Usually you can see that in their character. And so that to me is what bothers me as well, is the idea that they're, they're allowing him to just take over everything and provide this chaotic. And really, what, what else is happening, though? This is, he's creating civil war. He's, he's really creating civil war. And that's the most dangerous thing that, that's going on. What did David have to do with that? David had nothing to do with it. It's, it's the tribe. And even if the angry words were wrong words and they shouldn't have spoke the way they did, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. And that's what you find here. You know, one, the way that you listen to that argument, Israel, when they showed up, were a little arrogant because the way they responded to Judah was kind of like, hey, you know, you're last to endorse him, but first to show up. And now you're looking like you're the big guy. So you see their attitude going into that argument was selfish. And then we see also Judah didn't respond appropriately. Nobody defused this. And I can't pick on David, but, you know, they always say that the buck stops where? Stops with the most important person, you know. Um, and, but anyway, so this whole thing just destroyed what David had set forward and started to pull together. You notice the last time when he had that close to bringing them all together, it was Joab. Joab was the one that about shattered it. Because when the elders heard that Joab had murdered Abner, they were pretty scared. They were pretty upset at that because they made an agreement with Abner. So here we have a spiritual man who is working on reconciliation in a very gentle, loving way. Again, we see selfish, self-righteous people injecting themselves and causing this travesty. So, um, so they do. So let's go on. Um, now, this is a verse that came to my mind, I thought of, was in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. When we start to make this lesson apply to us today as Christians, when we think about, you know, how we interact, and there's no group of people that will ever have peace continually. They might have most peace, but there's still, even with general peace, there can be some disagreements and tension that can flare up. Never have complete harmony continually 100%. But that's why I think the exhortation that Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, when he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all what? Humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, how does that fit in our story? None of it. They're not walking in a worthy manner spiritually before God. They're not showing any type of humility towards one another. You know, they got to one-up each other in that argument, I bet. You say something, I'm going to say something nastier. Um, and there was no gentleness, no patience. And they're not bearing with one another. And there absolutely there's no love there. And they're not eager to maintain the unity. They just, you know, they just, all of them rebelled. And their rebellion failed miserably. And then the king reaches out and gives mercy and grace and forgiveness. And they turn on themselves again. They turn against him again. Can you think of an application? I, I think of Christ. I, I think of the way that how many times he's forgiven us how much that he has endured for us and that we turn right around and, and we behave in a manner in which dishonors and is destructive in just the general way we live. But this, I think, we need to look at 
as a collective group of people, of Christians, wherever you're at, to think about the way that we look at one another. And there's a lot of times, you know, I mean, it's very hard for us to hold back when some brother or sister in Christ says something, does something nasty, and, and it, it hurts. And it may be legitimate that they're wrong. You may be 100% right, and they may be 100% wrong. But how you respond needs to be the way Paul says here in Ephesians. To have humility, have gentleness, have patience, long-suffering, put up with that for a while. Don't be quick to respond. Goes with our lessons in James about the tongue. You know, thinking, and then and desire unity over your personal pride. No matter how you may be hurt, desire unity. Otherwise, you know what? You're not really much better than Sheba. And that's a lesson, I think, that's very powerful for us when we look at what Paul, and we see this happen. This happened in the church of the first century that the, Pauls were, the apostles were alive and interacting with people, and then we see it happening to us all the time. So this rebellion of Sheba might have been a national type of thing, but it's something very important for us to think about as well. So now we switch kind of back to David. So now we have a rebellion, back to a rebellion, another civil war, basically. And so in verse 3, and David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten concubines whom he had left to care for the house and put them in a house under guard and provided for them. But he did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death as living in widowhood. This was something that was necessary. It was not, and when it, he didn't make them slaves. He didn't lock them in like a prison. Basically, he took care of them. But there's no way he could have an intimate relationship with them again. And this is, this is what Absalom did. Now, granted, okay, it's kind of a consequence. This is exactly what Nathan said was going to happen, that it was going to happen that what David did in secret, that it was going to happen to him in public. So the defilement of all of his concubines was something that was a part of judgment that came upon him. But no way this is indicating that somehow that they were subjected to some worthless life, but it does say he took care of them. He provided for them, but he didn't have a relationship with them from there on. So they basically were like widows. Nobody else could marry them either, by the way. That was something that, remember, we keep talking about that idea of if a man was to take and marry a concubine to a king, I don't know why. I, I've never really found that link and why that is so empowering. But apparently it empowered the individual male that would marry the king's concubine. I don't know why, but so that, that was kind of another thing that I read about was that that's another reason he had to seclude them from being able to marry again. Um, they did have his children. So there may be something there that, you know, if one of those concubines and they have children, they're, they're also descendants of David. So I don't know. There's, but it's a, it's a much deeper cultural thing that I think we, well, I know I can't understand. But he took care of them. That's the key. When he comes back to Jerusalem, the very first thing he does is he, he starts, he's, so he's got this rebellion going on. He just gets back to town, and now he's having to deal with all of this. It's happening around him. And so he has to do something with the concubines, and take, he does, he takes care of them. But now he's got to deal with this rebellion. Then the king said to Amasa, Call the men of Judah together to me within three days, and be here yourself. So Amasa went to summon Judah, but he delayed beyond the set time that had been appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of Bichri will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he get himself to fortified cities and escape from us. So he gives him three days to get together and to pull together. So he's got to go to Judah, but he doesn't make it, does it? He doesn't, he's not able to do this in the three days. Now, what's, what's, what's a trigger point in here? Where's Joab? So David, the part of the peace that he extended to Judah, was providing Amasa the position of commander of the forces. And he never consulted with Joab. He just removed Joab. And remember, Joab is a vicious man. And so now 
Amasa, his first duty is to go and to put down this rebellion. Now, he has to go back to Judah. Now, he's, he's of the tribe of Judah. Um, but what else about Amasa? Amasa was also, he led the rebellion, the force, military forces for Absalom. So if you're Joab and you're sitting there watching and listening, you've been demoted, and now you have a rebellion come up again, Joab's a better general. He really is. And then the first task was to recruit. Now remember, the ten northern tribes, there's a whole lot more of them. So you need to go to Judah and get us some fighting forces. You need to get some military. But he can't. So he delayed beyond that appointed time. So he turns to Joab's brother, which is interesting because um, he doesn't ask Joab again. You notice that? Verse 6. David said to Abishai, Now, Sheba the son of Bacri will do us more harm than Absalom. So now he's telling him, take the Lord's servants. That's him. Take my servants. Not the guys who do the food prep. No. No. Not the butlers and stuff. What he's saying is, take my personal warriors, the mighty men of warriors. These guys. Take the bodyguards. There's over two to 300 of these guys. And now I want you to pursue them. So it's interesting that he's, it's, I don't know, but it seems like he's kind of given up on the idea that he's going to get four troops from Judah. But he knows that he has to take action. Strike now. Because he knows that if he gets to a fortified city, then he's going to be able to be protected. So that's what he's trying to do. And then he'll escape from us. Because what happens if he gets to a fortified city? You can hide there and they might chime in and help him, yeah? And then you got what? Now you got a besiegement on a city. And that's not type of warfare. You want to catch him out in the open and deal with this. And so, verse 7 and starting at 8, I want to break that verse 8 up a little bit. And there they went out after him, Joab's men. Notice that? So his brother is in charge, but it says here that Joab's men. So Joab has a contingency of men loyal to him. And then these are the kind of mercenary bodyguards. These go back to David's days when he was with the Philistines. So the Kurthites and the Philistites and all the mighty men. They went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba and the son of Bichri. When they had come at, they were at the great stone that is in Gibeah, Amasa came to meet them. So he gets there. They, they leave Jerusalem. They get up to a geographical location that we don't know, but there's a great stone, and that's where he met with them. And he gets there. And so I wanted to show you on the map. So... What we see here is the way that, um, let me back up, show you that map there, where Joab is, I mean, Amasa comes down from, what? Oh, my blinkers. I get my blinkers fixed. That's what it feels like I'm sitting there getting blinkers. Um, man, what? Back up, back up, right here. So north of Jerusalem is Gibeah. This is where Amasa finally catches up with Joab and this, the mighty men of warrior and stuff, and are going to then, he's going to join them. With, it doesn't say he brings any people with him necessarily, but it's possible, but he does link up with them and meet him there. And this is when uh, one of the most ruthless things that I've, I've read in the Bible, one of these things. And so look at what happened starting in 8. Now Joab was wearing a soldier's garment, and over it was a belt with a sword in its sheath, fastened on his thigh. And as he went forward, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not observe that the sword was in Joab's hand. So Joab struck him with it in the stomach and spilled his entrails to the ground without striking a second blow, and he died. 
Um, that, that's Joab. <laughs> I don't, you know, and that's, that's the thing at the end of this story we're going to get. How does Joab keep surviving? How, David, what's that? Oh, Judas. He was stealing from them. Judah was stealing from them. And, you know, his... Just a betrayal at the deepest level. And, and Jesus knew he was going to do it, didn't he? Jesus knew that Judah, Becky was saying that it kind of reminded her of Judah, you know, with Jesus and the way the betrayal. Because that's what he's doing. He's betraying David. He's, he betrayed him three times that resulted in murder. It wasn't just disobedience and not following orders. It was cold-blooded murder. And the way that he approached it, and he did the same thing, the same way he kills Amasa is the same way that he killed Abner. That, and he didn't just, this isn't just a clean little stick. You notice that? It's pretty, pretty graphic. It's almost, you know, he basically ripped his belly with one blow. That shows you, you know, and that he also was a very capable fighter. And he fell down without striking him a second time and he died. So um, then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. And one of Joab's young men took his stand by Amasa and said, Whoever favors Jacob and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. I'm sorry, whoever favors Joab and whoever, fav whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. And Amasa laid wallowing in his blood in the highway. And anyone who came by, seeing him, stopped. And when the man saw that all the people had stopped, he carried Amasa out of the highway into the field and threw a garment over him. And he was taken out of the highway. And all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Wow. These, yeah, that's exactly, you know, Becky said, like a bag of garbage. How did he handle Absalom? You remember what happened after he killed Absalom? See a model, she says, the anniversary seed biting the heel of the one who will crush him. If they weren't divided then, they are now. Hey, Chelsea. Say again. Yeah, they just casted him off like a, like a piece of garbage. They took Absalom and dug a grave and just threw him down and threw some stones on top of him. Yeah. Chelsea, good to have you with us. Been missing you. I hope all is well. So uh, Chelsea says, uh, the adversary seed biting the heel of the one who would crush him. If they weren't divided then, they are now. And that's, the, that's what's interesting is, you know, the way that this, the person says, Okay, who are you with? You know, young men took their stand. They're Joab's young men. And they basically are calling them out. Now, who's got the guts to say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not with you guys. You know, what you did was wrong. <laughs> uh, Joab would go, hey, come a little closer. <laughs> come, come here. Give me a hug. So who's going to say, no, we're not with him? He also, what's interesting is, Amasa is known to be the anointed commander of David's army. Joab, everybody knew that he had been removed and probably knew why. Because of the way that he murdered the king's son. If you're, if you're standing around and you just saw this happen and you didn't know this man was out of his mind, you're out of your mind. I mean, you should have run. Because now you just murdered the king's commander. 
for a guy who's been fired by the king. Yeah, and that, you know what, that's the other thing, is the idea that the, these, are, these are cousins, first cousins. All of these are first cousins. Um, and so they, they just carry him off the highway, throw a garment over him, and the people took off. Does anybody for a moment in this crowd, as they take off, think, well, okay, even if we're victorious, what are we going to tell the king? How do we, uh, how can we be so victorious that murdering the king's commander, it, it's just going to be overlooked? This is, Oh, absolutely. I think that anybody there would be deathly afraid to rebel. So, but everybody's got to be thinking on their way down there what happened as you're pursuing. And it wasn't like they just jumped on a bus and 10 minutes later they unloaded. We're talking quite a journey, quite a little time to sit and emotions calm down and the reality soak in that, wow, what, what are we going to do with this? You see, again, this is where emotions will overflow your spiritual life and cause you to do things that you get swept up in it. Somebody should have had the courage to say, I'm sorry, man, I'm checking out. Um, because this, this was just, again, another, and you're right. And that Joab is his nephew. These are all nephews, by the way. Put it in kind of perspective. So these are... Uh, the, the king's nephews, and they're all first cousins. So, so now we come back to the pursuit in 14. And Sheba passed through all the tribes of is, Israel to Abel, Beth, Makkah. And all the uh, Urkites assembled and followed him in. So these are all his people, his tribe basically are following him in, into the city. And all the men who were with Joab came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah. And they cast up a mound against the city, and they stood against the rampart, and they were battering the wall to throw it down. So remember what David's fear was? You know, David's fear was he was going to get to a city and basically be safe. He traveled way north even of Hazor. So we're talking, uh, this, this didn't just happen. I mean, this is uh, when I looked at that, it was about three days of a very high-paced walk. Three days to get there. And so, no doubt, by the time they get there. Um, and so they, they start to batter, start to try to take it over, and, and they're going to get him out. Now, this is where, this is a, this is where it's, it's another amazing aspect to this story, is what happens next in verse 16. Then a wise woman from the city uh, called from the city, Listen, listen, tell Jacob, come here, that I may speak to you. And he came near her, and the woman said, Are you Jacob? Joab. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. So she knows. She's calling for Joab. Are you Joab? And he said, I am here. Then she said to him, Listen to the words of your servant. And he answered, I am listening. Then she said, they used to say in former times, let them but ask counsel at Abel. And so they settled a matter. I am one of those who are peaceable and in faithful and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the heritage of the Lord? So this, what she's, when she says Abel, she's talking about their city. Why have you come to bring such violence? There used to be a time where we would talk about this before. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, we see where the president was setting what she's really talking about. And, and it was prescribed that if you had a problem with another city and you were going to war with them, first you went to try to seek peace first. Doesn't that fit with what we read in Ephesians? Seek peace first. And so in Deuteronomy 20, verse 10, And when you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably, 
and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. And it goes on to say then, the next part is, and if they don't, destroy them. So that's what she's doing. She's pointing this out. You know, we're a faithful city. You've come up to, to go to war with us. Why didn't you first approach us and say, hey, wait a minute, let's, let's work this out. This is what Moses' law had prescribed for them to do first off. So Joab responds, this is interesting. This is the same guy that's a murdering psychopath in my book. He answered, far be it from me, far be it, that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not true. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim, called Sheba, the son of Bichri, has lifted up his hand against King David. Give him up alone, and I will withdraw from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman, the woman went to all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and they threw it out to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, <laughs> And the, the spurs from the city, every man to his home, and Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. So, that's it? You know, it's kind of, okay, so uh, he, Joab says, no, I'm, I'm not here to destroy a faithful city. No, that's, that's really not what I'm here. We're after this one person. Yes, this woman must be respected, Becky's saying. <laughs> so it tells you about her influence, doesn't it? The fact that she's speaking for them. Where's the elder of that city? You know, where? And that, so she is showing an extremely important position among the people. And that's not unusual. That's not unusual. We know that in the, in, the, in the time period of the judges, we see where Deborah, we find many women that were very spiritual, and they were leaders. So I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised. And I think we ought to glorify the fact that, you know, we see this happening. Just because we don't have every story of a very wise, powerful woman written so we can balance it out doesn't mean that there was some injustice or uh, prejudice against them because Joab listened, didn't he? He could have said, go get your man. <laughs> he respect what she said. And the other thing, when we see what she does in verse 22, then the woman went to all the people in her wisdom. So when she, this is a wise woman. This is a, a woman that she was able to speak and communicate. Now remember, she was not by himself. He has some friends with him. It said that they all went into the city. So, you know, apparently they either overpowered them or they all said, yeah, let's give him up. But the bottom line was, and she is, she doesn't just say, we'll bring him to the gate. <laughs> what does she say? Behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. We're not even going to come out. We're just going to give it to you and you go away. We're not going to open up the gates. You know, she's not that silly. There, there's a part where she's smart and not opening up the gate and saying, come on in and get him. We're just going to toss it over. And so that's what she does. The only thing she knows is what he says is that he had raised his hand against the king. That's all we have is what Joab accuses, that the charge against him was treason. And how's treason usually dealt with? Usually capital punishment. And so that's what they did. Um, so they even did Joab's dirty work. You know, Joab doesn't even have to get blood on his hands. Well, he's already got a bunch on it. But so, and I just thought it's interesting that they cut the head off, throw it over the wall. And so Joab blew the horn. Trumpet, they all go home. And then we find this interesting conclusion to this, and then we're going to open up to discussion in, but, um, in 23 through 36. Now, it's like, this is like an administrative thing that comes up. It's like 23 through 36. All of a sudden, we have this 
like the cabinet or the important people who served uh, King David. And it's interesting, the very first verse, 23, is, Joab was in command of all the army of Israel. Benaniah, the son of Joadiah, was command of the Kethrites and the uh, Philophites, and Adoram was in charge of forced labor. And Josaphat, the son of Elud, was the recorder, and Shiva was secretary, and Zodak and Abiathar were priests, and Ira the Jerite was also David's priest. Yeah, Chelsea, you're right. Chelsea says, uh, you know, it seems like Joab does all the dirty work, but got prideful. He just, um, yeah. You know what I just thought of is when God, later on we'll see where God responds to David about building his house. And David, he tells David, what does he say to him? You're not building my house. Did he give him wine? The blood on your hands. You have blood. He, he says, you've got guilt. You have, you're a man who has blood on your hands. There's something that, about David that he says, no, you're not building my house. And I just thought with what uh, Chelsea says here, you know, that Joab does the dirty work, but he got prideful. Um, you know, he would have never lost his position as commander if he would have respected what the king said dealing with Absalom. Um, but again, this three times, three times, he shows such grievous uh, insubordination to David. And then at the end of this story, we see Joab's in charge. Uh, a little bit of uh, interesting characters in here. Adoram, who in verse 24 was in charge of forced labor. You remember back in Deuteronomy? One of the things that was said there, and I got to back up, if they respond peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. This happened before, too, um, where David uh, basically put uh, uh, some cities in forced labor. And so here we have Adoram is in charge of forced labor. Revenue. Mm -hmm. You're working for them. Yeah. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Don't we work for the man? We say that, the IRS? <laughs> so, now, that's not the point I was trying to bring up and, and mention, but the idea that um, Adoram is going to end up being murdered when the kingdoms divide, and when Rehoboam goes north and tries to excite basically raise their taxes and Jeroboam is going to try to get more out of them and it's Adoram that he sins <laughs> and it's Adoram who ends up being killed and so he ends up serving King Solomon but and he apparently maintained the same job but it ended up So you're saying, what do you think he said? Yeah, I, I find it very fascinating that there's absolutely nothing that says about David. There's a lot of things like this we've come across, isn't there, where you wonder, I mean, the only time like the one where um, um, Tamar's raped, it says he got angry. But we don't have a lot of that inside part where expressing and you know there's how much has he got going on as a king trying to reconcile and now he has this turmoil very close and they hold the power you know back in that day they didn't have a constitution and have a division of government like the way we have but one of the most fearful things and this happened at the last election was some of the rumor that the military was going to what going to take over, that there was going to be some sort of a coup. And man, you talk about fear. People were scared to death at the thought that, you know, that the Pentagon, the, the Secretary of Defense would step up and take over power because of the election chaos and all this stuff going on. It's always been a problem because 
If a king wants to take care of himself, he takes care of the guys who are around him who have the power, the military. Uh, if you'll recall, if you know anything about the emperors, uh, the majority of all the emperors that were in place, they were in place by the personal bodyguards of the emperor, the Petroian guard. They did it. And they killed him too. Caliglia, guess who killed him? Yeah, his own personal bodyguard. So, because they have such pro close proximity. I don't know, but I, I kind of wonder, is this something that maybe, you know, that David is, he is very capable, but David doesn't forget. He doesn't forget because, again, on his deathbed, one of the instructions he tells Solomon is to kill Joab, <laughs> execute Joab. But why wouldn't David do it? That's something that, and even when Solomon took over, it wasn't exactly like he was all in power and in place. It's on his deathbed. He's just, Solomon's just becoming king. He's a young boy. And David passes that responsibility on to him. David, why didn't you order it? Even on your deathbed, you know, I think he was afraid. Absolutely. I think he was afraid of him. Yeah. Yes. So we have a little bit of time for discussion. If you um, want to respond, let me know how you thought or what you're thinking or any questions before we kind of wrap up. If the audio was good, I'm glad that we're finally getting this, this down pretty good. And I think I found the problem you had Sunday. So, yeah, it seems like at least Wednesdays and Sunday mornings. <laughs> Uh, we're getting that pretty stable. Um, so I hope Friday morning at 10 a.m. you'll join us on the Bible podcast. I've also uploaded to the uh, podcast on Podbean, uh, the Bible class Sunday morning, so you can listen to it. Audio when you're driving around town, you can, uh, the video is also on YouTube. I have somebody that's helping me now, going to work on getting all the the categorize and the YouTube channel kind of fixed up and helped me there. So uh, one other thing is our Facebook page. I messed it up. I don't know if you saw it, but I have to really just completely redo it because of the way I initially set it up. So um, the one that's there is Pan Lanier Avenue Church of Christ. Um, that one is going to go away, and the one that's going to come in place, the only difference is the avenue won't be in the name. So you'll have to go there and click um, follow, to follow. So Chelsea, she says, he reaped what he sowed at his death. The sound is good there. Good. Well, I hope everybody's well. I hope everybody had a good new year, and hopefully we'll start out another one that's a, a good year coming up, good Bible studies and, and growth. Um, but like I said, um, I also did kind of reconfigure the streaming to where now it's not coming to our Facebook streaming as Ron Herring. <laughs> it, we're streaming directly, and it's going to as us streaming it. So I'm able to get a little better at scheduling it, so you'll be able to find it, hopefully. So it's working out to find things. It's kind of putting a little bit of icing and details on all the core problems we've been working on. So thank you very much. Um, and it's good to have everybody with you. Stay healthy. Stay safe. We'll hopefully see you this coming Friday morning. If not, worship. Bible study 10, 930. Bible study 1045 worship. We'll see you guys.